you about. But the title of my mer message today, not my verses, but my message is Courage Equals No Fear. You know, I was talking about this last week when we did the, that part in Numbers uh, 13, but the more I thought about it, the more I figured I should just do it, because I, I already had a whole study on it, and I just didn't know if I was going to do it. But the more you think about what we're doing and how we're going to grow these things and how we're going to overcome discouragement and tribulations and trials and fears is to understand what the Word of God really means. You know, and one of the things that really bothered me when I, the first time I ever did this study was the reason I did this study was because I just wanted to encourage others encourage, and encourage myself and what the Bible says about courage. But what really bothered me, when I, I, I'm not going to go over it completely, but I touched on it last week, was that the world teaches that courage, you know, is bringing your fear under subjection or overcoming your fear. You know, I've heard many things like the way to beat fear is to step into fear or you've heard that saying, the only thing to fear is fear itself. But the Bible actually is very specific on what we should fear and what we should not fear. And so the, the part of the message I want to focus on is right there in Joshua 1, uh, verses 6 through uh, verses 9. And let's go there real quick. And it says, Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance of the, an inheritance the land which I swear unto the fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayst observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayst prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayst observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And let's just read uh, verse 18 for the sake of the verses that cover courage. And it says, Whatsoever he be that, uh, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. So, you know, the Bible is here. He's telling them several times in just one chapter. And the only other time we see this is also in Deuteronomy 26. We'll touch on that. But to be strong and of good courage. And then he follows it up with don't fear or be not afraid. And what the reason, the, the very first time I decided to do a study on the word courage was because, you know, you read the verses before and after uh, Joshua 1 8 and Joshua 1 8 is used in business a lot because it's the only word in the King it's the only time in the King James you're going to find the word success and you know it just says this book of the law shall not depart thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good success the only challenge is when business people are teaching it they only focus on prosper and success and they don't tell you that you know you got to meditate on the word day in and day out you know day there in day and night right Every day, in the morning and in the evening, what are you doing? You're meditating on the Word. Well, how do you meditate on the Word? You've got to read it first in order to find out what it says. But the challenge is that the world has a very different view of what courage is. You know, and, and, if you, and it worked out perfectly. I was already doing this message. But if you look at any of the stuff that's going on with uh, Pastor Robertson in Australia, you see both sides of the narrative, right? So you see this Muslim guy who's apparently like, he's not an imam. Because they scheduled the thing with the imam, but he's like a representative of all the imams or whatever. They have a representative. So whatever he's considered. And he's the one fighting back and forth, and it's all interviewed. And then they interview him separately, and he's kind of playing this victim like, you know, we're just we just want to practice freely our religion and do this. And what they're portraying him as is this brave soul who, who dealt with this onslaught of hate speech. And that's how the world treats you, right? They... They show, they always show the victimization, how you overcome the victimization, right? If it's in the sodomy world, it's, you know, poor, poor little queers, you know, they're running around and mama didn't love them and daddy didn't love them and you don't know what it is to be me, you know, and the things that I have to deal with because everybody leads a normal life and but how brave it is for them to come out and just step into the, their own skin and be who they are or just pick whatever, right? You know, poor woman who... You know, just didn't have any opportunities, and you know, she just didn't. She she's been oppressed all her life, but now she gets to choose her career and 
her home and her money and also her body because it's her body poor thing that she never got a choice in the matter but now with the rebel it's always this like overcoming this fear and then controlling and they call that courage i mean i, I think it was a couple years ago when bruce jenner because that's what i call him because that's his name by the way yep. man. but when you i think i didn't watch it or i didn't see it i heard that he he won some award for espn and then it was like the courage award or the bravery award, I don't know, look it up, because I know, but it had to do with being courageous and being brave. But the Bible tells us different, right? I mean, these people are afraid, or the world is usually afraid of something, and they're trying to control this fear and then make it something that is not. The Bible says no fear. And I'm gonna prove to that, uh, prove, you guys, prove to you guys today, uh, with the Bible, how courage is no fear. So, couple of things. I always use the 1828 dictionary, but actually if you just go to dictionary.com, you know, if the world understands stuff, they just don't want to, you know, embrace it. Dictionary.com actually says courage is having no fear. And I didn't print that one up, but the 1828 dictionary defines courage as bravery, in, intrepidity, the quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits, valor, boldness, resolution, it is a consti consti constituent part of fortitude, but fortitude implies patience to bear continued suffering. Uh, suffering, courage that grows from constitution, often forsakes a man when he when he has occasion for it. Courage which arises from a sense of duty acts in a uniform manner. And we know it's our duty to preach the gospel. The Bible alludes to that in the New Testament. I'm not going to uh, turn that for the sake of time, but. I did a small study, and you know, I'm I'm of the mindset, like most of you guys are here, that I don't need to know the Hebrew or the Greek or not. And but I did it for my own sake. You know, you look, and I have all like the Strong's words of courage, and how many times it's used, and the different Hebrew words that you're using for courage. But what it all comes down to is that's why I like the English is that you you read all these definitions, and what it means is no fear. You know, I'm not going to read all of them because, uh, as you guys can see, it's a lot. But it was really more for, for my sake of just proving the point that if you just get the basic definition of a word and then you just read the Bible and let it define itself, you don't need to be a super smart, super intelligent, PhD, MBA, whatever scholar, you know, in the Bible. Because that's the other thing, right? The world will, the other thing that they do is then you go into religion and religion always makes you feel like if you don't have all these acronyms behind your name and if you don't know how to use these fancy terms, then you just, you don't know anything about the Bible. You know, I, I've had those arguments more times than I care to, where they're like, well, you're just using cop as a, uh, God as a cop-out. You know, just, what about the root word of this, and the this and the Hebrew word of that, and the Latin of this, and the time that it was written, and the context it was written? Look, it's right here in the Bible. It's at, this the context is right here. It tells me. Amen. I know basic English. I can understand this. That's about as far as I can go. I don't know if I want to waste more brain power than I need to. It's hard enough to understand some of the word, let alone try to go deeper into that. So a couple of things that we're going to go, and just bear with me, and then we're going to go into the points, but, you know, the word courage isn't found but like 20 times in the Bible. And the, out of the 20 times, or 20, 19, 20 some odd times, most of them, the word is being defined, and it always ties it to no fear, whether it's within the context of the verse, or a few verses before, a few verses after. I actually went and I read all the all the the chapters that included the word courage, just for the sake of making sure that I wasn't speaking out of context. And you know, you, you got number thir numbers thirteen twenty. We know that one from last week. You know, it's the twelve who go out into the land. And really, I mean, if you think about it, God's not asking for their opinion, right? He wants them to go into. And I'm not going to rehash that whole sermon, but He says, "Look, go into the land and tell me if it's good." And then what was the bad thing that they were fearful, right? Obviously, if he says be strong and I mean be courageous or have be strong and have good courage, and you come back with fear, well then you're being disobedient to the the, the command, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 31, uh, God commands Moses and Joshua, and it uh, and they obey it. It becomes law, and the people fall away, and, and that becomes fear. You don't have to turn there because I'm gonna go through these real quick. There's a lot. So like in Deuteronomy, they use you know you see Deuteronomy 31. And the word courage is used in verse 6, 7, and 23. I, and I only covered courage, not courageously or very courageous, right? Or encouraged or and stuff like that. In Joshua, we saw those, right? Where you see God commands Joshua to go out and 
Keenan Teller, Andy Coverton. The big thing is, I didn't know, so I was doing the, the sermon and deciding whether do I want to go when Moses gives the blessing to Joshua in Deuteronomy, or do we want to focus on Joshua? But Joshua 1, but in Joshua, God gives the blessing and the power to Joshua. It goes from Moses to Joshua. So there's a difference too, right? We have to understand, and both of them use courage a lot. And the reason that I say this is because just because a leader of a religious formation, right? And I'm using this because of other religions. But just because someone says that this guy's good, doesn't that doesn't make it so. Now, we should be trusting if we trust our leaders. But the other thing that we need to know is, is that guy, is that man appointed by God? See, Moses gives him the blessing in Deuteronomy. He says, Joshua, you know, you're going to lead this people, Israel. He's going to lead you. But in Joshua 1.8, who's talking to him? God's the one that's anointing him to be the leader of the people and go into the promised land. So Moses does it because God commanded him to, but then God follows up and reinforces it. See, and that's a way, that's a really good way for us to know if the people that we're dealing with, or if we're listening to someone, uh, another pastor, or if we go and listen to this message, that's a good way for us to determine if that person is, is a man of God, right? And then, you know, just because Pastor Cobb, uh, 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 Man, the word it loses me right now. Just because he ordained me as a pastor doesn't mean that I'm meant to be a pastor. God has to back that, right? And how do you see that? Well, it's the fruits of my labor, right? By their works you shall know them. And you can do that because even though I make mistakes, I should be pretty consistent in my work. Where I stand in my life, where I stand with my family, with you guys, in the ministry. You know, where are my efforts being put? Now, if you hang out with me long enough, you're going to find all those things. I mean, that's really easy. But overall, if you look at it, you should be able to find, you know, within the Word of God, okay, that guy, he represents God. He represents God. He's a man of God because he follows the law. And this is what the book's talking about. Everything that you look at when you're looking at the word courage, it's tying it to the law and it's tying it to the Word of God. It's funny how you get courage from reading the word of God, because the only time that you should fear, what's the only fear that, that God demands of us? Is the fear of God. You know, so it's either courage equals no fear, because we fear God, or we have no courage, because we don't fear God, but we fear everything else. And the Bible actually talks about, you know, how the wicked be pursued. Even though, I mean, the wicked flee when no one pursueth. They're, they're looking back, and there's nobody there, but they're still scared. They're uh, paranoid. Joshua 2, you know, it talks about the absence of courage, that, you know, it leads to utter fear. It's not like a healthy fear like we have for God. There's like, you know, it's talking about having no fear in God, right? Joshua 10, 25, you're going to find John uh, takes on many kings and destroys them all. Then you're talking, you, you run into 2 Samuel 10, 12. You know, and David takes down uh, King Hanan after they reject his kindness. And then the same thing in 1 Chronicles. Because, you know, Samuel and Chronicles don't repeat themselves in the stories. 1 Chronicles 22, when King David's instructing Solomon... And he says, be strong and have good courage. He's tying it to the word of God in the Bible. You know, you're not just building God's house. You're building it for this reason. First Chronicles 20, 20, you know, King David informs the people and instructs Solomon. And again, courage is tied to the word of God. No fear. You know, Second uh, Chronicles 15, 28, Ezra. Then you see Psalms and 27 and 31 when he uses the word courage. Again, he defines it with no fear. Uh, in Isaiah 41, God speaks of his power, and again, no fear. So most of the verses, if you read them within the context of a few verses before or after, there's no fear. Now, if you read the entire chapter or one or two before, it's, it has to do with no fear. So I just wanted to drive that point. I mean, I'm not going to read those all. And then the only time you find the word courage in, in the New Testament is in Acts 28, 15, and it's Paul taking, you know, being courageous. You know, it's after he has to, when he has to go into Rome. So... Uh, I was I'm not I was like should I read all those verses I mean we'd probably be there for an hour so I was like no let's just go through them real quick but the first point I want to make about courage is that you know the world and, and this is more of a comparison sermon is that you know the world says look when you have courage you feel fear yet you act that's really what the world will say look I mean if you're gonna go into battle you're scared make sure your butterflies uh, fly in formation I don't know how many times I heard that in my business life or that you're stepping into fear, or the only thing to fear is fear itself. But the reality is, God says, there's no fear, and you obey God on when to act. 
And what I mean by that is not every battle should be our battle. And, not, and I'm not saying that to be fearful or to shy away, but God has a battle for us, right? He's going to give us the trials. We, we need to pick the fights if it's a godly fight, but we shouldn't just be picking any fight, right? He says, look, you just obey me and you show no fear. And you're gonna, like, for example, right now, Pastor uh, Robertson's in Australia. I mean, our battle is to support him with prayer, with, uh, you know, we can help him with monetary funds. He's in that battle. Now, I don't wish that on anybody if we can avoid it, but God says, look, if you live godly, you will suffer uh, persecution. So he's, he's suffering for the cause of Christ. That's his specific battle. It's our duty to support him in any way we can. But, I mean, that doesn't mean that I'm just going to drop everything and fly out there. Now, maybe God, God has a different plan, and maybe we have to fly out there. I don't know. But that's not, that's not the case right now. That's not what God's showing us. And if you go to Joshua 1, go back to Joshua 1. We're going to read those verses again, and it starts in, starting in verse 5. says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. See, when he's giving Joshua his command, remember, they've been waiting in the wilderness because they went to spy the land, and then they had to wait 40 years, one for every day that they were out spying the land. Now it's his time to go into the land. Moses is now given, you know, Moses is now 120, now he's given up the ghost, and, and God says, Joshua, here's what I need you to do. And then, and then he tells him, be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto the Father to give them. He gave, when did he swear that? Abraham. Long time before he's even going on. So the time to act is different than the time to obey. Sometimes we get a little impulsive. I know I have a lot of impulsive things that I want to, you know, sometimes I get a little impulsive and I, I do things in haste, and what it ends up doing is it does create waste if you don't do it correctly. And I didn't mean to rhyme that, but that's just the way the saying goes. You know, if you do things in haste for God, you will create waste. Wasted opportunities for going out there and doing the right thing in the ministry. Wasted opportunities for going out there and leading others to Christ. Wasted opportunities to do the right thing for God. See, no fear means that you have to be patient. Because sometimes in our fear, that's what really happens, right? When do you, when do you uh, make stupid decisions in a time of panic? What do they teach you? Like, you know, if you ever go to medical, uh, so any medical field, or you're in the armed forces, or military police, or all that, what's the first thing they try to knock out of you? They try to make things instinctive. That's why they put you through boot camp, and that's why they put you through, like, they're shocking off. So that you're not panicking, because when you panic, you do, you make, uh, uh, impulsive reactions, right? And decisions, and usually it's a wrong decision. And that's what God says, look, when you have courage, you look at the whole situation. Joshua didn't go into the land, and Caleb didn't go into the land when they wanted to. And Caleb was impulsive in the sense his feeling was, hey, let's go now, which was a good thing, right? But he did it in God's time, not his time. And he, let's keep reading, it says, verse seven, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayst observe to do according to all all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law, so again we're talking about the law, shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. And then he asks them rhetorically, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And this book of the law is speaking of the Bible, but specifically also in, in Deuteronomy, if you read, Moses actually finishes writing his portion of the book. And then it gets attached to the uh, Ark of the Covenant as they go into the land. They have an actual physical copy of a book that says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth. And of course, now we know this book. For us, it's the entire King James Bible. Amen. Shall not depart from our mouth, right? Amen. So, second point is we have to the world to say, okay, look, for you to be courageous, follow your heart. I mean, I don't know how many times if you grew up in a generation that watched any movies, you've heard that, right? Yep. Do what your heart tells you. If you grew up in a generation like me, that uh, you know, I think that's why we have a bunch of sissy guys. Is we grew up in a generation with a uh, 
uh, romantic comedies. That was the thing in the 90s, right? What's, what's the main theme of all those romantic comedies? Follow your heart. By the way, I, I could never stand them. My brother loves those. By the way, I mean, if he ever sees it, said, you know, he still loves them to this day, so he, he won't hold it against me. But it's either follow your heart or follow Christ, right? Turn to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. And we're going to be in verse 1. 1 through 10, Jeremiah 17. What does the Bible tell us, uh, you know, about following our heart versus following God? Jeremiah 17, uh, verse 1, he's talking to, to Judah, and it says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. See, the Bible tells us to write his word in the table of our heart. What they do, they wrote the sin on the table of their heart and upon the horns of their altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills, O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and thy high places for a sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thou thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the, he uh, like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when, God, when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit it. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and is spread out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall, be, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. So we see here, if we trust in man and in ourselves and our sin, it's a curse. And God knows that too, right? The Bible says, be not deceived. In other words, we shouldn't be acting, we shouldn't lie to ourselves. And that's kind of what the world does. You know, when we pretend that courage is controlling fear, that's a lie, not only to the people that we're preaching it to, but to ourselves. And the more we preach that to ourselves, the harder it is for us to stand on God's word and his truth. And I really believe that's one of the reasons why it's so hard for preachers to get up and be unpolitically correct in all their sermons or to preach the entire word of God. Because what ends up happening is you end up thinking about maybe the sin in your life or who you're going to offend in, in, in the congregation. And then you think, well, you know, my heart says that I shouldn't do that. Because that guy in the back, I know he's a fornicator and an adulterer, but he's, his ties are bigger than everybody else's. I mean, that's how these churches are run, right? Or the youth of this world, they're into everything, but how do we keep the youth in? Well, we shouldn't offend them so easily because then they'll leave. And that's what's happening, right? We got all these great programs and, and all this rock music and all this gyrating and, and you know, scandalous dress from women and men. And, you know, you can't make up one from the other. Why? Because they're following their heart. They're not following Christ. And Jeremiah is specific. He says, look, you're writing these sins on your heart instead of writing the word of God. And so we should follow, we should follow God with no fear except for the fear of God, right? And then we should follow Christ. And then the third point is persevering in the face of adversity versus knowing you will persevere. And I mean, I know it sounds, and that's the thing is the devil is real, real quick to make things subtle, right? I mean, if you're not paying attention, if we're not careful, it almost sounds like I'm saying the same thing, but I'm really not. You know, persevering in the face of adversity is, that's what the world has been doing for a long time with all these sins that, that they're now edifying. Is look at all the poor people that have suffered through all this stuff. Look at all these women, women's suffrage. Look at all these uh, sodomites. You know, they're victimization, they're the victimization. Look at all these, you know, well, it's, we're not murdering babies. We're giving choice. You know, we're we're not uh, we're not changing the word of God. We just want to let everybody love. 
Yeah, and you don't know the adversity that they had to go through. And, I, and you know, you ever watch any of this? Uh, what were, I, was, uh, I was at one of the airports the other day. You know, uh, they have this thing called uh, American Ninja or Ninja Warrior. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's some, you go through an obstacle course, apparently. But I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, and if you ever watch like American Idol or any of these game shows, there's always like this, the, the moment before. And it's always like, well, I'm here and I'm gonna sing this song because my mom died of cancer five years ago. And I had to, it was a struggle, and I'm, this was for her, you know? Or the guy like, and I'm, so I was watching this little, this obstacle course thing, and that's how it is, right? A couple years back, you know, my brother was in a car accident, and he lost his ability to walk, and so now I'm gonna win this obstacle course so that he can see me persevere for whatever. And it's always like this adversity that they're coming out of. But then it's, it's just all feelings. The Bible <laughs> says, look, you know you will persevere. Not only why, not only, not only do you know you're persevering, he says, I've given you the victory. God's given us his victory. We don't have to play this pity party. I don't have to go through and tell you, oh, you know, before I got saved, I, I was in the world of sin. I mean, you guys know I'm a sinner. I don't have to go through a pity party and be like, oh, man, that... Enrique, man, he really, he really came out of it. He overcame all that worldliness and all, you know, whatever it is. You know, you hear these guys and it's like the drugs and the alcohol and the womanizers and whatever else they want. It's all, and what it really does is it makes it, it, what you're doing is you want to look cool for the world, right? Because yep. when, when people are young, the, what's the first story, the most common question you want to ask somebody from the military when you're young and dumb? Hey, man, did you ever kill anybody? <laughs> you know, because you, th you think it's something cool that they went into battle and that they killed somebody. But the reality is, what I'd like to know now as I get older is, you know, did you just make it through? And were you able to keep your sanity? Well, the only way they would have ever done that in the first place is through Christ, right? Let's go to uh, uh, 2 Samuel 10, 12. Go to 2 Samuel uh, 10, 12. First Samuel, then second Samuel, chapter ten. By the way, when I remind myself of this, it's just to remind myself. I'm not telling you guys; it's just to be funny. But I need to bring my Bible. It's not English and Spanish because it's just a longer process to get through all of it. But if you go second uh, Samuel ten, twelve, and let's actually start uh, in verse nine. So what's going on here is, you know, this is where. David wants to be kind. And, uh, well, let's go to first one. Let's just set it up real quick. It says, It came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of the servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So the, the whole thing is he's being nice. He sent servants. And, of course, Hanan... His, his advisors are like, look, David's slick, and he's going to spy out the land, and he's going to take over. So they end up, you know, almost turning a blind eye and rejecting that kindness. And it ends up causing a war, right? And there's strife there. And if you go down, Joab is one of the leaders for David. And in verse 9, he says, when Joab saw the front of the battle, so now they're in battle, he says, was against him before and behind he chose all the choice men of Israel and put them array against the Syrians. And then the rest of the people he delivered into the hands of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. So now they, they're, they're, they're surrounded on both sides by the Syrians and, the, uh, and uh, the, the children of Ammon. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. So Joab said in... He's just basically getting them ready for battle. And he says, look, this is what's going to happen. If this happens, we're going to do this. If this happens, we're going to do this. He says, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. See, he didn't play this pity party. You know, I mean, that famous movie, The 300, you know, the Battle of Thermopylae or whatever you want to call it. It's this big adversity thing. And I'm pretty sure it was a, a serious battle, something that, you know, to admire, but God's just saying, look, I just need you to have no fear and let me do my will. And Joab actually has the same mentality, right? He says, look, 
be of good courage and let us play the men for the for our people and for the cities of our God and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And see, the mentality for us is knowing that we will persevere. And that doesn't always mean that the battle we're in is the one we're going to win, but we know we've won the war, right? Because that's the way the world does, right? They're like, well, look at them. They said God was on their side, but nothing. Look what they did to Jesus on the cross. That's the best example, right? They didn't say, well, can't you get yourself down? You know, if you're the son of God, can't you bring, you know, your soldiers and your angels to take care of you? And that was in his battle. That was in his time. He had to die for our sins. And that's what we need to be uh, aware of, is we need to remember that when we're in battles, when we're dealing with things, whatever it is, that we can't get discouraged because we know that the victory is there for us if we do God's will. The challenge is, God's will is at the end. We can't see it, but we want to figure it out. So we end up changing the whole battle. And then we run away, or we, we scurry in fear, or we do things. But the only way to do that is when we have no fear. See, the minute we start letting fear dominate our lives is the minute we start to question where God's leading us. Because think about it. It's real easy to get discouraged. How many churches really go soul winning? Soul winning. Not knock on doors like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. How many churches really do that? I mean, even if you look at all the, the YouTube channels and all the churches that have come up in the last two years, 30 churches, 50 at most. I mean, and I'm actually maybe adding, I might be embellishing, but I like to think that there's churches that aren't as, you know, on YouTube and they're not as... Uh, they're not voicing it on Facebook as much that are out there so winning. I know there's churches here in Houston, but if you think about it, in a country where there's hundreds of thousands of churches, that's it. How discouraging can that be if you start to think of it in the grand scheme? I mean, we're up against it. And then fear dominate, right? When you see big numbers against you, then, you know, if, if you ever play basketball, the bigger the guys were, I said that last week, but the bigger the guys were, then you start to think, maybe we don't have a chance. You know, I always like to think that we did, but... You know, some of the, all you got to do is let it get in your head, and then it starts to discourage you from doing the things that you need to do for the Lord. Let's, uh, let's keep reading here. And uh, uh, point number four, and if you turn to 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. And it's going to sound like, like the verses that I covered like three or four weeks ago, but it actually is a separate part of Scripture on King Saul. 1 Samuel 13. And, it, you know, it's standing up for what's right is what the world will sell you on. But o obeying God unto the righteous right. See, when you have courage, you'll do what's ultimately right. Because the world likes to play, especially the, the more we grow into, uh, the more we fall away from God, the more we create our own sense of righteousness. And what I mean by that is, you know, people understand morality, but then there's like the justification of morality, right? You know, is it really murder if, if it's in the womb? God says it's murder. Yep. If you take a life, it's murder. Yep. But the law in the world, the world's law, says, well, we're standing up for right, but it's the right we've created. You know, and so, and, and you can, I mean, pick a, pick a subject and they start doing that, right? Go to any country, you know, in some countries, it's, it's, it's murder, it's not as bad as here in the state, or vice versa. Uh, here, it depends on the state you go to. Pedophilia is not as stringent as other things. I mean, some people, pedophiles will go to jail for six months, and you kill a dog, and you'll go to jail for several years. You know, people are like, well, we're standing up for what's right. Well, no, I mean, God says stand up for the ultimate right. God's right, right? The, the ultimate truth. There's only one absolute truth. Whatever God says, there's no middle ground. So then go to 1 Samuel 13, 8. I'm going to give you a few examples. So a few weeks ago, we were, when we were talking about idol worship in the book of Galatians, we read in 1 Samuel 15, you know, how Saul got in trouble for not listening to God. Well, this kind of seemed to be his pattern. In, Psalm, in 1 Samuel 13, 8, he gets in trouble right away. And it says there, uh, let's go to actually 1 Samuel 1, I mean, 1 Samuel 13, verse 1. Let, I'm just going to read that part. It says, Seth... Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. So he, he's just starting out his reign. And then go down to verse 8, it says, And he tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came unto Gilgag, and, and, and I know I got ahead of myself, so I'm going to get real excited. But basically, he went in, and there was a battle, and he conquered. And then he's supposed to wait for Samuel 
to sacrifice, and instead he gets a little, what, panicky, a little fearful. I really, I mean, that's, that's the only way I can describe it. It says, yep. and the people were scared from him, and Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me, and a peace offering, and he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgag, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. In other words, everything I just talked about. Hey, man, I'm persevering. I forced myself to make an offering. Because woe is me. I mean, I saw we're being surrounded. The people are running away. I mean, this thing's getting out of hand. Verse 11, and Samuel said, uh, I'm sorry, verse 12 says, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgag, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord had sought him a man after his own heart. We know it's speaking of David. And the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. See, Saul forgot to fear the Lord and decided to fear the world. You know, people are leaving. He's a people pleaser. You know, oh no. You know, when we started the year, we, we had about 15 people showing up to Sunday evening services, and now it's, we're down to like eight. I've got to force myself to make a sacrifice. What I'm going to do is, because, you know, we're not going to sacrifice, so I'm going to start fasting. I want to make sure you guys know I'm fasting. And then when I bring my tithes and offerings, I'm going to put them right there in the plate in front of you guys. And gold on the, I mean, that's really what he's doing. I'm not going to do that, of course. But that's kind of the attitude he's taking. Is Look, God, he's the king, and he's making this big spectacle. He's like, look, I'm going to sacrifice, and you guys are going to watch this. What he is, is he's fearful. He's fearful of the people, not of God. And he's not standing up for what's ultimate. See, he's still in it in the name of God, but for all the wrong reasons. And wars have been fought in the name of God, but not in the name of God's word. They just That's just the excuse to go out there. I mean, as a matter of fact, I just heard, you know, what's his name? Uh, Jim Jeffers, the guy from, and I was talking about it earlier this morning, but that guy is horrible. He's the pastor of First Baptist, uh, First Baptist Dallas, like downtown. And if you, if you follow him at all, he's on like Fox News and all the conservative stations. He's all for war, like 24-7, like, let's just go to war. He's like, the Lord justifies war. Donald Trump's the best president ever. We're going to go to war. Kill the Muslims. Go to the Middle East. Protect the Jews. Like, it says war, 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 in the name of God. The Bible says different, right? He says we should go out there and fight what battle? The spiritual battle, not the physical battle. I mean, it's a good thing because, I mean, being five foot nothing and a hundred nothing, I don't know how physical I can get with a lot of people, right? But, uh, you know, and let's look at Matthew 16 on that same point. So we go to the New Testament. We just go to Matthew. We see that the same thing happens when we start getting a little, uh, we start getting that perseverance and we start fearing things. We start thinking we know better than the Lord. And we go to verse 16. And this is, so Peter had just confessed Christ to Christ. Right? He, Christ had questioned him and he answered and he says, uh, and they have this talk, and then you get to, to verse 21. You know, verse 15 says, But he said unto them, this is Jesus, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's skip down at, you know, verse 21. And he says, uh, From that time, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, 
but the, those that be of men. So we see that pattern, right? I mean, you see the verses that we read earlier. Then, then said Jesus, uh, then said Jesus to Simon, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So see, courage is to have no fear, but fear of God. See, Peter starts fearing. He starts thinking, oh, well, Jesus won't be with us. You know, it's like if uh, Pastor Cobb said, well, the Lord's called me and I'm no longer going to be the head pastor of this church. You know, I have a special place in my heart for Pastor Cobb. He ordained me. He's been my spiritual leader here. You know, I'd be, I'd feel a little bit lost without him, right? At first, but it's not my duty to keep him here, whatever the Lord leads him to. That's how we act, right? You ever have like, uh, maybe not, not so much now, but you know, remember like in junior high and you're moving to high school, you were about to lose that friend because you weren't going to be in the same classes and you try to line it up so you had to, this is a, 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 you guys probably, your kids won't experience this because mine won't either, but if you're a product of the public school system, what you try to do is set up all your classes with your buddies. And then one of your buddies would come home after like the summer and be like, man, my dad got a job somewhere and this summer we're going to move somewhere else and we're no longer going to stay in touch. No, we'll be friends forever. I'm going to sign your yearbook. <laughs> but what it was is you start fearing, right? You start trying to figure things out. And in, in your ignorance, you actually try, I mean, I remember... You would then have, you'd be bold enough to go to the parents and be like, no, let Jimmy stay. He's a really good friend. Maybe you don't have to take that job. I mean, who, here I am, and I'm not, Jimmy wasn't a friend of mine, but I'm just using an example. But that's how we are, right? As, as humans, that's what Peter's doing. He, he doesn't want to lose Jesus, but he doesn't understand the bigger picture. See, the reality is he started to panic. He started to try to figure things out on his own. I mean, think about it. Rebuking Jesus. Of all the people you should not rebuke, Jesus is, is the one that, it doesn't even compute, right? That just shows how that term, uh, you ever hear that term, familiarity breeds contempt? Yeah. It's so true. So why should we act uh, discouraged or fearful when people do that to us? Think about it. If Peter can rebuke Jesus, then anybody can rebuke me. Even if I'm doing the right thing. It doesn't take a lot for somebody to say, oh, that guy's an idiot, or he's not doing the right thing, or I don't like his preaching. Or, you know, he talks too fast, or I don't know, he reads too fast, I, you know, whatever things I've heard in my past. But that's what happens. And what did God say to him? Or did Jesus say to him? Well, Jesus is God, right? Is, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, you don't understand. And so that's standing up for what's right. See, Peter was righteous in his own mind. He's like, ah, this is the right thing to do. Jesus, you, you can't go die. You can't go do these things. And Jesus is like, no, get thee behind me, Satan. There's an ultimate truth. There's an ultimate right. There's an ultimate plan. I mean, he's the creator of everything. <laughs> I still, in my mind, I it, it just, it's funny to me that Peter's sitting there telling Jesus what's up. You know, we, But we do that, don't we? When we pray or when we do certain things and we get discouraged, what are we doing? Basically, we're telling Jesus what's up, right? Oh, you know, things didn't turn out the way. Maybe I'm not meant for this. Or maybe I shouldn't do this. Or maybe I should have said it different. And what we're really saying is, Jesus, you didn't know what you were doing. Because God said, what did he say? Knock every door and spread the word. It's not, we don't have to, like in business, right? We don't have to close every transaction. We just got to plant the seed. But, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, I could have said it different. Just say the words, get the gospel out, and, and take care of itself. Let's go to the last two points, and we'll close out. Expanding your horizons or letting go of the familiar. So the world will get you to expand your horizons. In other words, be open-minded. Or should we stay focused on Christ? And what I mean by that is, when you start fearing things, then the other, the natural thing to do is when you fear the unknown, they're like, well, you know, you should try, I'll try anything once, maybe twice. You know, people say stuff like that. And what it is, is when you start bringing it at that mentality into the church, that's where you start getting in trouble, right? Because you start looking for things that aren't in the book, or you start making stuff up that's in the book, but then you twist it to your mentality so that you can get your way. And that's where we've gotten to in society today, you know? Church isn't fun anymore for young people, so we have to expand and understand the youth of the day, and because you know they're just different. It's a different generation. You know, they grew up with Nintendo and iPads and cell phones, so we have to give them Nintendo and iPads and cell phones and rock music. No, we just give them the Word of God. People are still people, right? We're shifting. Instead of staying true to the Word of God because we're expand, we're letting go of what's what's familiar. You know, we we just sang those two hymns. Those are good hymns. Amen. There's a lot of doctrine in those hymns, but no, 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 those are boring. 
you know, which by the way, actually singing those hymns a cappella is much easier than if we sang one of these like 7-Eleven hymns or whatever. Not, they're not hymns, 7-Eleven songs, a cappella. Have you ever tried to sing one of those songs without music? Like you sound horrible. I mean, I don't sound that good now, but you really sound horrible because there's no structure to the music. There's nothing. It's just the repetitive action that's just look, meant to lull you into stupidity. But let's go to James 1. Go to turn to James 1, 16. Book of James. Verse 16. We're going to go 16 through uh, 18. And it says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so the thing, the, the point I'm trying to make is, when we stay focused on Christ, we don't change. It says God has no variableness, and we're kind of His first fruits of His creatures. So the reward, it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. No variableness means He doesn't vary. He's He's on the straight and narrow. You know, a double-minded man is a stable in all His ways, right? It says, uh, neither shadow of turning. You didn't turn to the right or to the left, just like we read those verses. It says, Of his own will begat as he with the word of truth, the ultimate truth, who, uh, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, what he's saying is, God doesn't change, and if we get that gift, the perfect gift from the Father, then we shouldn't change. Right? The man, the flesh will change, but not the spirit. In other words, Let's stop trying to change stuff up. Let's stop trying to expand our horizons. Let's stop trying to change those things that, that don't make sense to us or, or that we feel people leave the Look, people are going to leave the church no matter what. If they're going to leave the church, they're going to leave it. And I honestly think in a couple of years, these mega churches and all that, there's just going to be an even greater falling away from all that because that gets boring. You know, you ever been to a concert? You know, I've, I've only been to like one or two concerts. I've never liked concerts in the first place. I've been to one or two. After a while, you get really bored. Especially if you have to stand through the whole concert. You're waiting for the one, two songs that you know. And other, all the other songs are like foreign to you, even if you follow that. I, I think we went to see YouTube one time and you know, it's not, not anything I'm proud of. You know, this is back in a long time ago, like 20 years ago. But I remember when we went to see YouTube because a bunch of friends of ours wanted to see them. They really liked them. I kind of, they were like, okay, whatever. And so I remember just standing there I'm just waiting for like the one or two songs that I knew. Your feet hurt, it's really loud, everybody's screaming, and it's all hot and sweaty. You're just kind of waiting around. It gets boring after a while. But see, when you're in the Word of God, nothing is boring because you're always going to get a new word. You're going to get a new teaching. You're going to grow and edify yourself. See, look, we're sinners saved by grace. So if you're sinful by nature and God's going to correct you with His Word, there's always something to correct. We're not, we're not perfect on this earth. So then there's always something new in His Word. His Word isn't new. It's new to us, right? But the world gets bored of this stuff. They're like, oh, well, I try to read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then I got to Deuteronomy, and I called it a day. Well, yeah, if you read Deuteronomy the first time, it's tough. You know, the more you read it and you start to see Jesus in there, and you start to see the prophecies, and you start to see, you know, how He ties it all together. Man, it gets real fun to read the Bible. But the first few times, man, that's a rough book to read, you know, but... Well, after time, you start to see the consistency in his, in his creation, in our lives, in people, in human nature, why things happen the way they do, why people come to church, why people leave church, why people love you, why people hate you. All of a sudden, everything starts to make... I don't need to go to a psychology class to understand why people hate me. God said in His Word that they would hate me because they hated Jesus first. Okay, it makes sense. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. But, you know, you go to one of these hippie churches... And people are like, well, it's all love. We should never hate each other. Not only us, but we shouldn't hate anybody else. And then you don't want to end up hating anything. But then somebody like us comes and preaches the word, and they hate us, right? They'll close the door on us right away. <laughs> you ever meet those guys? Remember when we go soul winning? And uh, 
you, you meet the people who are like, oh yeah, I go to church. Are you saved? Yeah, I don't have time for you. And they close the door on you. Ah, that's the hippie church they're going to. So the final point, and then we'll close out with this. Go to Philippians 2, and then we're going to close out with uh, Psalm uh, 27. Philippians 2 is, are you going to face suffering with dignity or obey God no matter what the world thinks? And the, So the world, they want you to face suffering, but it's always got to be like this heroic, dignified thing. Right? I mean, if you're going to suffer, everybody has to see and has to see how good you suffer. I mean, really, that's how it is. It's like this, this like, I'm a hero mentality. I think that's why these, these hero movies are so popular. Because, you know, the hero's always like, if you've ever watched any of these hero movies, you know, it starts out, the hero finds out he's got superpowers or she's got superpowers, and then they face the enemy, and they beat up the enemy, and then the enemy finds out their weakness, and they're losing. I mean, the movie, it looks like, that's it. You're like, why am I watching this thing? They're going to they're gonna lose. Right, and I'm talking, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe they've changed the plots. This is movies I used to watch back in, like, I'm talking Superman, like back in the 80s, with Christopher Reeve, but it looks like he's down and out. He's got the kryptonite around his neck, and he's not gonna make it. And then, all of a sudden, he, he summons some internal strength, and he's able to overcome. That's how the world wants you to suffer. That's why those movies are so popular, because that's the mentality, right? Is that if I'm gonna suffer, everybody better see. But God says otherwise, he says, look, let me show you how you're going to suffer. We'll go to Philippians 2, verse 1. It says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, have the, be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. In other words, we should be like, you know, what is it? In August, uh, Brother Shelley's coming. He's soon to be a pastor for Pastor Anderson. In other words, when I look at someone like a Brother Shelley, I should esteem him better than myself, and I should be of one mind and one accord with those that are fighting the good fight, right? And the reason I bring that up is because it's just near. I mean, it just came up. That's a good thing, right? But the sufferer will be like, oh, you know, I don't know if we need somebody else here because well, I'm already here. And I mean, I knock on a lot of doors. You know, in that 100 heat and it's humid. And I'll go out anytime, anywhere. And I record myself and I put all the selfies and the YouTube videos knocking. That's how it is, right? That's the danger. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying some people really do it for that reason. They're doing it because they're getting that glory. Are you doing it because of that or are you doing it because you love the Lord? He says, look, let... Uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, I'm, I know I'm older than that guy. So the first mentality, the world thinks, well, if I'm older, I know better. But the Bible says, look, let's, let me esteem that guy better than me. Brother James, let me esteem you better than myself. You know, Brother Scott, Brother Eli, better than myself, you guys are better than me. That's what the Bible says. We're of one mind and one accord, and I should think that you're better than me. And I should promote you. And I should encourage you, and we should go out and fight the good fight, and I should learn from you, not just be like, well, I'm the pastor, I'm the leader, do as I say. Whatever. I don't want to hear it. Because that's, that's how the world thinks, right? And that's how they suffer with dignity. Oh, it's hard. And somebody positive comes, and they're like, no, but you're doing a good work. Yeah, but man, you don't understand how hard it is. Well, so it, you never win, right? Man, but you, you, you led so many people to the Lord. Yeah, man, but I could have just done more, you know? If I, if I could, I'd do this thing 24-7, but I got to work, so it's just it's hard. That's how they are, right? You're suffering like that. What does the Bible say? Let's keep reading. Verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in, a, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above, a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, 
Jesus didn't come in, in the glory that we envision him when he's coming the second time. So why should we act like that? And you meet all these false religions and these false preachers, and that's how they come in. I mean, Joel Holstein's just down the road, and that guy has a private jet and a helicopter and a big home. I mean, he comes in and that, right? Look at me. But God says, look, don't esteem others better than yourself, and let me show you, Jesus did it the same way. We thought it not robbery. He, be, he, you know, he took on the form of, of the man, of a service. Sorry. Even obedient and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Sorry, somebody, I thought somebody was coming in and they distracted me for about a second. Somebody's out there. They, just took, they, they took me off. Like, hey. But go to Psalm 27. This is the conclusion. And it's with one that has uh, to do with those verses on, on uh, courage. And this, this whole psalm talks about no fear. Go to Psalm 27, verse 1. And it says, A psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon to eat upon my flesh, up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a, a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me, therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy, I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not, hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the well of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So in conclusion, we should have courage. It's something that we're going to struggle with. The flesh and the spirit are constantly at war, but if we really get into the word, he will help us overcome. And the biggest thing is, if we fear the Lord, if we truly fear the Lord, a healthy, respectful fear. Have you ever done something and you're like, Lord, don't strike me down? You know, I mean, obviously, we know that's not, well, who knows? Maybe some people have been struck with all, by lightning because they didn't fear the Lord. I'm just saying, you ever do that? That's the kind of fear you should have, is that, Lord, before I go out so winning, forgive me all of my sins. You know, forgive me for the things that I've done. Because we're not perfect. You know, this week, we can. there's a list of sins in my life. We're about to go out soul winning. Let's purge that from ourselves and let's build courage. Because, you know, sometimes we go into nicer neighborhoods, and I'm not so fearful, but sometimes we go into other neighborhoods and it gets a little ominous and shady. But if we have no fear, God's going to take care of us, right? And we should always go with that mentality, with that, uh, I don't know, with that spirit that when we go into the hedges and the highways, we go in with courage and not fear. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your message, Lord. More importantly, uh, you know, it's really easy to speak on courage. And it's really easy to get up here and preach the word, Lord. But, you know, will the message ring true and will it be consistent under tribulation and under persecution? You know, it's my prayer that not only myself, but those here present today would be able to do so. And not only that, but that we would be able to voice our courage and our strength for others that are in trials and tribulations. Today, Lord, we just raise up Brother uh, Pastor uh, Robertson, Lord, and be with him as he deals with uh, the false narrative of hate speech and the false narrative of, uh, you know, one world religion. Lord. Let him speak for Christ and let him go out there and preach the word. And also, Lord, just give us the strength as we go out so in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.